it's really my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for this session. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Dr. Joe Abood, he's currently a professor in the shoulder and elbow division at the Rothman Institute. Uh, when it comes to the shoulder and elbow stratosphere, Joe's kind of like a SpaceX rocket, uh, extremely dynamic. Uh, he is nationally and internationally known. He is a uh, well-versed clinician and researcher, but what's most important about Joe is he's a dedicated educator. He has really helped out a lot of local, regional, national, international students, residents, and fellows in advancing their career in orthopedics. Uh, and he's probably one of the, my you know, most important uh, people in advancing my career in the shoulder and elbow world. So I'd love to have uh, Dr. Joe Abood come up as the moderator for our first session, which is the humorous from top to bottom, fix, nail, replace, or nothing. Our uh, panelists, including myself, uh, are also local products one being Dr. Asif uh, Ilyas and Michael Vospikin. So Dr. Ilyas is also at the Rothman Institute and Dr. Vospikin is currently in Newark, but also trained here in residency uh, at uh, Thomas Jefferson. Gentlemen, come on up. All right, well, thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here and uh, I love this. I love educating, I love being around what I consider a lot of young people here in the audience. Uh, keep the lights up a little bit so people don't fall asleep, please. Um, plus, I'm old, so I can barely see sometimes. Um, you know, this will be, traditionally, I like to run fast-paced, energetic, no perseveration. You're going to be cut off. you got to have thick skin. You get what you get, and you get no regrets. And, um, you know, we learn through cases. We discuss, make salient points, uh, argue. It's good. Um, we're friends. We're all very good friends up here. So uh, at the end of this, we'll still be friends, but we may not agree on some things. So if the audience has a question, either come down to the mic or shout it out. Active learning, it's so fun. It really is. It's a, it's a pleasure. You know, I love it. All right, so okay. that's our panel there, uh, circa 209. All right, case number one. <coughs> and... 22-year-old female, previously healthy, um, you know, average build, presents a distal humerus fracture. She was arm wrestling. The best part of this case is she gave me the video. This was down in Wildwood. So, <laughs> I was like, wait, hold on, give me that again. So, this is what she has. She comes in with this. She's nervously intact. Um, Sir dominant arm. <clears throat> and that's what it looks like. Jack, what do you think? Pretty simple. Uh, distal third, spiral humeral shaft fracture. Uh, what's her nerve vascular status? Intact. Okay, so not uncommon to be intact. Uh, young female, uh, displaced, not something I would treat conservatively, uh, something I would consider surgical intervention. Okay. Would you get any uh, other imaging? Uh, usually these do not extend into the uh, articular surface. You could certainly consider a CAT scan to evaluate the distal extent, uh, something that can be considered. Okay. Audience, surgical, non-surgical. Raise your hand. Surgical. Majority. Non-surgical. It's about three or four. Reasoning behind non-surgical. It'll heal about uh, excellent range of motion. It'll heal quickly with excellent range of motion. Strength basically normal, no scar, no nerves, no nerve, no cranial nerve. How how do you typically immobilize these when you treat them non-surgically? Okay, and how long do you immobilize them for a 25-year-old? How about she's 68? Same thing? Same thing, but it's isolated. Yeah, okay. All right, if we answered this, treat non-op. So, <clears throat> op. Michael, how are you going to treat it? If, uh, we're going to assume you're going to say op. Yeah. Okay, how are you going to treat it? So with these, this is, I mean, this is one of my favorite cases. This is one where you get in there, you know, lateral, come into a lateral window, Gerwin Hodgkin's kind of approach. Come in there, clamp it, get maybe one, two, two, seven, 
This is one of your favorite cases. You're a hand surgeon who uh, bread and butter stuff and a distal humeral spiral fracture is one of your favorite cases. Okay, you're weird. All right, keep going. <laughs> um, one or two, two, seven lag screws across it. Neutralize it with an extra articular plate coming down. Get three, four screws above, three, four lockers below. Just let it move. Okay, Asif, you're outside the box usually. You're doing this wide awake, <laughs> local infiltration. <laughs> Um, to just speak to what the, the other doc said, I, I think it's not unreasonable to treat this non op if it's minimally displaced, uh, young person, good soft tissue envelope, it's not angulated, it's not shortened based on those initial radiographs. Um, so I don't think it's wrong to. Uh, I, I too would treat this operatively mostly because of the ability to mobilize the patient uh, more reliably, avoid issues with stiffness of the shoulder and elbow, avoid issues with malunion. Um, and the early kind of stages, as you know, is, is challenging for the patient. The first few weeks with non-op are, are uncomfortable, but I don't think it's unreasonable to treat uh, operatively. But if we go operative, I'm with Mike, uh, posterior approach, lateral power tricepital window. I think the key for, the, for these cases is to identify and protect the radial nerve. I think the mistake that can be made with these cases of the, of the middle and distal third of the humeral shaft is not identifying the nerve and just kind of sweeping it with a cob and hoping it's not there. I think this, re this uh, warrants uh, reliable identification of the nerve uh, distally and you trace it approximately across the fracture. And it's, oh, it's always surprising how intimate the nerve can be to the fracture with these middle and distal third fractures. It can be quite unsettling sometimes how intimate it can be. Um, so I think identifying that's the key move here, Joe. Uh, res Chief Residents, raise your hand. Is there a chief resident here? Oh yeah, guy behind the apple hiding. All right, uh, you're, you're calling the OR. What are you telling him you need? Positioning, what are you doing? We did exactly what you guys said. So we did a, uh, sorry, uh, going back. We did a paratricipital approach, identified there's your radial nerve, your ulnar nerve on the two sides, a couple of lax screws, four, five, ten hole plate, satisfying case in general. Okay, so that's you know, a pretty straightforward case, right? Any, any questions, thoughts, anyone from the audience? So Joe used a 3-5 plate on this, right? It looks like a 3-5 DCP. Is that right? Uh, I think it's 4. Well, maybe. It looks like a 3-5 to me. Yeah, it looks like a 3-5. Uh, I, okay. I, I wouldn't be happy with the fixation. You would not? No. Okay, good. I would not be. Also, uh, always instruct the patient that even though they're preoperatively neurovascularly intact, even with delicate uh, and exquisite exposure like Asif performs for the radial nerve, there is a 15 to 20 percent chance of radial nerve neuropraxia post-op with intraoperative with a surgical intervention. So I would make them aware of that. Uh, I wouldn't be satisfied with this with this fixation, even though you're a great surgeon, Joe. Uh, I wouldn't be happy with this fixation in this patient. Explain why. Uh, first of all, uh, I like to get at least eight cortices above and below. Uh, for humeral shafts in the younger patient, I like a four or five. Uh, or a narrow four or five, but with this type of fracture, which tends to go fairly distal, uh, you want to get more distal fixation. So there are extra articular plates that can take you down the lateral column that can give you more fixation distally and proximally. I do like the lag screw fixation technique that you've utilized, but one, you only have about maybe four and a half cortices above and maybe three and a half to four cortices distal to the fracture site, which is not strong enough torsionally to support this fracture in this young patient. Okay. Fair, Although she's got fair point. Bones, so you may get a little lucky if you immobilize her. And then, fair point. And then, you know, one thing with these is that, because I like that same extra articular plate, but the problem is I find with that plate sometimes is that when you have a patient that's a little more petite, that kind of angle of inflection where the hockey stick bends basically, a lot of times doesn't fit people that are smaller. It fits large patients very well. And then what you end up doing is being careful, and I've had to revise a couple other ones from somewhere else that it kind of blocks the fossa and then you can't extend the elbow completely. So that's something to think about, especially in a more petite patient. But one trick when you run out of real estate distally and you can't get that extra articular plate on is you can put four O cortical screws through a three five plate. 
So since you're upsizing the diameter of your screw, you're making a more rigid construct with a little bit less real estate. So you can sometimes buy yourself a little bit of wiggle room if that extra articular plate doesn't fit very well in the posterior part of the humerus. If you're concerned about the size of the patient and not using that extra articular plate, you can always use orthogonal plating mm -hmm. and augment them with, with mini frags, small yep. frags also. Also, with the amount of high noons they were drinking, uh, I'd ask whether or not she was a smoker. So if she's a smoker, it's also something to make sure you have good rigid fixation on this type of patient. Just occasional crack. Joe, but so not, not tobacco. Joe, since, we're, uh, broad since, street. since we're piling on your fixation here a little bit, I, I was going to say the similar things as Jack, but I think if you're going to do, th I think 3.5 is fine. The book answer is a 4.5, but I think 3.5 is fine, but you should try to shoot for eight cortices if you can. If you look at the top of your plate, it looks like you got tired and didn't fill the top of the screw, like the top most uh, screw hole. So there's room there. Your distal most one is unicortical. It could be bicortical, I'm not sure. So there's definitely room to augment that or go to the longer extra particular plate. But the one other thing I wanted to add, is uh, along the lines of what Jack said. So if the nerve is in pre-op, it can be out post-op, and, and, and sharing that with the patient preoperatively is important so they understand that that is a possibility. And being involved in these cases on, on a medical legal side, often one of the things I do in my own practice and I recommend other people do is once they're done with their fixation, to take a picture of the fixation like you have there, but showing the nerve lying over top and outside uh, the fracture and the plate, and I put that in every one of my charts of my own cases now, uh, because later if they're going to see someone else, they don't know, um, if, and th there's a lot of judgments all made about what happened to that nerve. But if you have uh, imaging in your chart that shows the nerve was protected, it's now sitting outside the plate, a palsy is a known complication of this, and at least you've done what you can and demonstrated proof of that, because looking at the imaging, you have no idea where the nerve is. So having a picture, particularly nowadays with our access to smartphones and, and electronic systems. So, so, Mike, you do a lot of these. What percent do you think get a, a palsy post-op in your hands? No, no, Mike, I was asking Mike. It's, oh. it's, I'm, Mike, are you asking Mike? Yeah, I've had two that were, since I started seven years ago, I've had two go out that were in pre-op. Okay. Yes? We've been using the uh, checkpoint nerve stimulator, and uh, very helpful, but make sure the patient's not paralyzed. Yeah, good point. All right, we're going to keep moving. We got a lot of critical feedback. All right, previously healthy, 30-year-old male, right-hand dominant, strong build, occupational history, fireman, serves in the military, asymptomatic COVID at the time of the incident. <clears throat> he uh, became hyponatremic and had a seizure. Uh, we actually wrote this up as a case report, hyponatremia secondary COVID. So <clears throat> both shoulders problematic. All right, Jack. Don't ask for more views. Okay. So you have it there. He's got a subcoracoid dislocation on the right. He's got a obvious fracture dislocation on the left, and uh, close reduction was done for both shoulders. So. Okay. Advanced imaging. Well, we'd like to see the post reduction films, but I can't get any more films. So I right. Like exactly. In yeah. Or out, so. yeah. Yeah. He was down the shore too. Yeah. Down the shore. It's not Lebanon. We it's shore, shore memorial. You know, in and out. Yeah. This is summer. Yeah. Generate our revenue and get them out. Send them somewhere else. All right. And if you're from Shore Memorial, I apologize. I'm just joking. All right. <laughs> so, okay, this is the left shoulder. It's not good, Mike. I, yeah, thanks. That's really descriptive. Okay, can you give us that in a little more articulate way? What would you like to say, Mike? So that's the hand guy version of uh, how to approach a shoulder CT scan. <laughs> um, well, what, you have to wear the pens if you're a hand surgeon. Are you, you wearing loops while you're looking at this, you know, Mike? Do you know how hard this is to fix seated? Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you wear your loops for these, Mike? Absolutely. Your <laughs> hammies must be tight after a case like this. <clears throat> so, I mean, you know, the thing here is, he's a, how old was this guy? He's young, right? Thirty. Fireman. Yeah, I mean, he's a young guy. Military. You know, we've 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 taken care of a couple of these at, at our place where they just have this dusted head, dusted anterior portion when they dislocate out the back. And I mean, you know, it, if you can cobble it together, it's nice and you try to buy some time. But I mean, we've, we've in all honesty, hemmied a, a number of people like this I, age I was because I, it's just I destroyed. I, mean, I, I think you, I'm listening, it's, it's a bad injury. This is something yeah. you can fix. Yeah, this so, is a yeah, this oh, yeah. question you, is, you can cobble from, together, from a teaching sure. perspective is, is do they try to reduce this in the ER versus I don't try to reduce this, we're going right to the OR, we're going to do a closed reduction with paralysis in the operative arena. If we can't get it closed reduced, then we'll go to an open and then our, and then our 
recommendations will move forward from there. If you can get a good close reduction in the, e, in the OR, and this sits back and there's less than 20% of any anterior head uh, involvement and then the lesser sits in good position and there's no recurrent instability, this person may get a, away with a gunslinger. Knowing this cervical neck fracture, uh, those are very difficult to perform and sometimes you go straight to open reduction if you can cob that head back. If the head sits nicely, you could throw a couple screws across it. It all depends upon what you get uh, after the reduction. If you, if you elect to reduce it in the ER, uh, you know. Okay, you we're going to go to the next one, Jack. The head. You, you, know, you know what the challenge with this uh, is, among other things, and Jack touched on, is that so at 30, even though it's a bad proximal humerus fracture, head's involved, um, et cetera, you're going to try to fix this yeah. and, and give him a chance. I mean, and his neck's involved, but the arterial right. portion of the head is, is Right, so, you know, if it goes on to AVN or post-traumatic changes, you'll, you'll live to fight another day. But in terms of the acute management, it's repaired. The problem is, though, without the CT scan and you just go on, on plain images, multiple reduction attempts may be made, and that head is locked behind the glenoid, mm -hmm. and it's not going to go. So that's where sometimes you'll have these situations where the ER has been trying for a couple hours and they kind of get it reduced. It may even make it you know, worse, and then they get the CT scan, and then you realize what's going on. Or you know you have someone who's comfortable with this, and they may do a gentle reduction, doesn't take, and then say, let's get a CT scan. So we often, the paradigm is reduce first and get a CT scan. But in this situation where they have a posterior dislocation setting the seizure, you can't, it's not your typical anterior inferior dislocation. So Understanding the fracture pattern, actually having the CT scan early may lend you to say, listen, let's not pull on this a whole lot in the, in the ER. Let's do this properly in OR. It's going to need surgery anyways. Let's minimize any further injury to the head. Now, that's easy to say, you know, in hindsight, 2020, because you're showing the CT scan. But I could see a scenario. We had a case like this just two months ago with someone on cocaine who had a seizure. And they tried it for a while to reduce it, and it was out the back. And obviously, we had to take them to the OR to repair it. So sometimes getting a CT scan early may not be such a crazy thing. Okay, we're going to go to the, we still got the other shoulder. <clears throat> this is the right shoulder. So they obviously reduced the right shoulder. Yeah. And was there an attempt at the left? It doesn't really matter, so. Yeah. Joe, can you run the, the, the images again? So that's the left. That's in there. Yeah. So, he, all right. Now, what are you going to do? Right. So, As he's reduced. There's no. Doesn't look like there's any glenoid bony injury. He's got some inferior displacement of his GT. It's just created tuberosity, but the rest looks. Okay. Looks good. So, sh show of hands uh, from the audience. You're operating on this patient, in general. Just I'm not saying which side. You're operating on this patient. Hands up if you are. Up high. Up high. Come on. Everyone got deodorant on? Okay, good. All right, you're not operating on this patient. You're treating conservatively. You're going to try to re reduce the left side and treat conservatively. Anyone not operating? Anyone doing a reverse on the left side? Come on, not one biter for reverse? It cures, it cures cancer. Um, okay, um, so who's operating on the left side? Okay, who's operating on the left side only? Okay, who's operating on both sides? <laughs> you stupid shits. No bites. All right. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. That's what they're here for, Joe, to learn from the best. <laughs> so, wait, wait, but wait, wait. We have polytrauma, right? Yeah. I mean, you got right. multiple extremities affected. And he's young. Polytrauma in a 30 year old. He's young. So, right. you're going to operate on one side and leave the other side for conservative management? No. How's he going to do personal toilet? I mean, how, I mean, he's 30 years old, right? So, what are you guys going to do? You're going to ORAF. One side? I mean, obviously, I'm showing you I'm going to ORF both I, I, sides. I would have yeah. I would have done both. You would have done both? Yes. Mike? I think I probably would have because of the polytrauma. Yeah. Isolation on the right side, no way. F yeah, f f but firefighter, 30 years of age, uh, displacement of the greater tuberosity. You don't want cuff dysfunction. It falls within guidelines. Right. The other thing with the tuberosity, so even if, it's, even if it's an isolated tuberosity, you could make the, make the decision to op treat it operatively because you can assume a rotator cuff injury as well. And you can make that argument. It's not a strong argument. I mean, an isolated but, tuberosity but, stuff to watch carefully. You could yeah, displace right. superly and posteriorly. He's lost his shoulder. In the setting of bilateral, 
with initial uh, dislocations, I think it makes perfect sense so, to repair both. I mean, he's 30, yeah. two to three millimeters of displacement of the greater tuberosity or indication in the young patient. And so. the other thing with the greater tuberosity fracture is, you know, a lot of that, if you're gonna follow that non-operatively, you have to be able to trust your patient to come back. Because, you know, I've had ones burn me where it didn't look too bad, it was pretty minimally displaced, and then they disappear for two months and they come back and they're like, my shoulder's not working so hot. You take an x-ray and that thing's way out in left field. That's because you did it endoscopically. Excuse me? Two to three millimeter displacement matter to you? Yes, the direction does matter to me. So, I think it's un understandably superior. Correct, displacement. correct. Two to three millimeters and it doesn't move. If it's two to three millimeters, uh, inferior, I don't care. If it's right. posterior, so I, it's I care as well. Yes. Posterior, I worry about as well because if it starts sliding more posterior. Posteriorly, they, uh, it's real. It's when they get missed, that's a real problem. If it misses and it displaces. Yeah. If it stays two to three millimeters in a 30-year-old, I'd probably be okay with that. Yeah. Posteriorly, I get very concerned. They, they lose rotation. Yeah. So we decided to do, so does anyone want to change their vote now that the panel's voted? Bilateral fixation, anyone? Still no? Holding your, to your guns. Okay, we're all wrong. All right. Um, that's why it's a shared learning experience. Everyone learns from everybody. So I decided to do both sides for the variety of reasons we just discussed here. Uh, on the left side, we started on the left side, then did the right side. On the left side, uh, it was a uh, sort of uh, anterior axillary slash delta pectoral uh, approach. I uh, was able to use fluoro throughout the case, obviously, for both sides. Uh, open the rotator interval. Uh, a, a nice trick that I've learned over the years is uh, putting a laminar spreader between the coracoid and on the shaft. If you can catch the part of the shaft, distract it. And that way you can easily lever a cob and just bring the head back in without crushing things and, and, and displacing that anatomic neck fracture, which is obviously a concern for AVN. It actually reduced really easily, really nicely. Uh, ended up doing uh, sort of a, a partial subscap takedown slash split to fix that portion of the lesser that was damaged using, uh, I think it was six, five anchors and, and fix it that way. And then did fluoro to assess the fixation. Uh, then went to the right side. So this is, the, you can see here where we kind of did partial subscap takedown, fixation of, of the lesser. Uh, with uh, suture anchor uh, based fixation actually. So, you know, not a lot of cold hard steel. I know uh, Jack already hates the fixation, so that's perfect. And this was the uh, right side, delta pec with a little split there to make sure the tuberosity was absolutely as close to perfect as I could get it. Um, and then this is the, the right side, just a few screws, but obviously enough fixation that he's gonna be able to move. So did these. You, did you augment your fixation of the greater with suture. sutures? Yes. So bone yeah, always. Oh, okay. not not. Uh, I don't do bone tunnels. I, I go at the musk, uh, the tendinous, uh, bony interface, and I use those sutures into my plate. Yeah. This is six months post-op. His X-rays. Um, talk talk about your your uh, immobilization and your treatment. So um, left. So the left it was four weeks. The right, I let him use. Gunslinger uh, for four weeks? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, right, I let him use almost immediately. So I said just kind of a, for comfort sling. So he had his right, he was right hand dominant. So then I let him use his right arm immediately. Left, I uh, wanted to give it about four weeks to make sure, because it was you know less robust fixation, obviously, make sure it starts to integrate. And uh, then um, start him in therapy on both sides. Actually, the left side is rehabbed a lot faster, and he's much happier with the left side than he is with the right side. Uh, these are so uh, ASCS 85 on the right, 92 on the left. He doesn't have pain, still no signs of AVN. This is his motion at six months. You can see he's still uh, tighter on the right side with internal rotation than the left side. Yeah, that that's one. really good range of yeah. motion that's for six months. My experience. Can you go back, um, Joe, to your 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 pre I mean your uh, positioning? I think it's worth talking about. If you go back one more slide, like so, um, so you, you're in, you're in a beach chair position. I think for the sake of discussion, so there's a lot of fun ways to approach these. And one of the ways I've moved to recently in the past several years is supine. I used to uh -huh. beach chair as well. Um, and the issue with beach chair is <clears throat> it's a little bit more positioning time. CRM can be a little more challenging, can be a little bit tighter with other people involved. If it's a polytrauma situation, sometimes there's issues with the other limb. 
So another way to approach these is, um, is to keep them straight supine on a Jackson table, or even on a regular table with their shoulder levitates off the, uh, off the table a bit with the, and the arm board capturing the forearm. And what that yep. does is, you know, you, one person sits above and one person sits in the axilla, and then C-arm comes in regular uh, from the opposite side. The challenge is laterals uh, is, is the hard part, but in terms of ease of positioning and access and, and having more people involved, it's, it's a nice way, alternatively, particularly in a situation where you have both sides, yeah. um, there might be some merit to that. Great points. You know, as a shoulder surgeon, when I go to the beach, if I don't have a beach chair, I can't sit down even. I can't lay, I can't lay flat. I can't use a towel. I mean, and I it's just ingrained in our everywhere. minds. It's always no, no, right. beach chairs everywhere. Right, and that's, <laughs> we're all a product, we're all a product no of man, our No like, man, next team can help you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the other, the other thing with the supine is, and I switched doing supine because getting a beach chair at our place is a, it's a task, and let alone one with all of its parts. But um, one of the things that you can do to kind of facilitate your exposure and make the imaging a little bit easier is either Jackson or you take like a 4085, flip it with the diving board and have them on the radiolucent portion. But if you take a hand table from the contralateral side under the patient, you can make a radiolucent basically area that you can prop the shoulder do on. Do you use mini flora for this also? I do. Yeah, and endoscopic mini flora. Okay. Uh, you know Good. it with a beaver blade. So yes, thank you. then if you bring that hand table in from the other side, you basically have a completely radiolucent arm board without the metal thing underneath or any of that other things to navigate with for your fluoro. Oh. Okay. Uh, audience questions or comments? Oh, okay. Nothing, come on. Come on, learning is a shared experience. If you don't come out of your comfort zone, you'll never learn. No dumb questions. Okay. All right, 59 year old male. What do you think, Jack? Uh, if you're going to give me the one view, the, 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 the Abood rules. We'll do a group selfie. We'll do a, we'll do a group selfie. Yeah. Hashtag. <laughs> there we go. All right. All right. Perfect. All right. All right. Shoulder 360, temple so, problem. Yeah. Selfie. Joe, I'm gonna, so, so Joe, one view of Hey, Jack, rule. one second. I'm going to push back on Joe. So it's a little unfair giving one slide. So one of the rules of evaluating, and uh, Dr. Okay. Mon right. is here. All right. All right. You're, you're right. Here we go. And he here we go. This, and I can here we go. You, there we go. One you second. I'm going to tell you that Dr. Ramon will never make a comment on an image if he doesn't have adequate imaging. Does everyone agree who's worked with Dr. Ramon? He will make no comment okay. on it. He will so you, you do charity work. You travel overseas. Of course. How often do you have to do things in suboptimal I'm, conditions? Well, listen, we are... We're we're at, at Temple University. There's plenty of good imaging here, so and the Rothman Institute and other other great places. So one imaging is a little rough, and Dr. Ramon would be all offended right, by right, the lack I'll, of. I'll, I'll give you. So all right. <laughs> I'll give you this that. is a trauma panel. Uh, I would say looks like a light bulb sign or a vacant glenoid sign. Although one view, you see some one view is no view. I agree. You, with you see some acromiohumeral narrowing. I would say, is this guy out the back? Okay, he's not. Okay. But he does have either. The conditions we currently have or aspire to as we get older as uh, orthopedic surgeons, schizophrenia and Parkinson's. <laughs> so he's, he's, he's kind of institutionally based uh, living. Got a lot of pain. He's got this. Oh my God, a cuff tear. You can't have a cuff tear or a yeah, trauma panel. He had a this you this see is just dumb. Disease, so. Okay. All right. So you have a cuff tear. God damn, shoulder surgeons bring cuff to trauma panels. You got this. Uh, Mike, do you, have, do, you, do you know what that is? The fatty infiltrate of the cuff. I remember, I did your rotation. <laughs> oh, wow, that's good. Yeah. That's good. So th this is what this guy has. And so this, this story, you know, takes a turn here, okay? Massive cuff tear. J Jack, you know, this guy's a failed conservative man. What are you going to do? Yeah, I mean, the issue, you have multiple issues here. So the guy is institutionalized. He's got recurrent instability. He's got a massive irreparable cuff tear. Uh, and he's schizophrenic. And he's got Parkinson's. So he is... Unreliable strike from a psychiatric one, standpoint. Two, He's rigid. Yeah. Uh, so keeping him stable is extremely difficult. There's really, really only one, there's two options. One, let him dislocate until he goes away. Yeah. Two, if you truly, you know, are a humanitarian like you are, you, you want to do something surgical for him. There's only one option to keep him stable. Uh, but then with his Parkinson's. What's that option? Uh, it would be an RSA. Not a fusion? Uh, you could fuse him. Okay. Uh, and you know, the audience, the question is, we, is, does he toilet himself? Does he have pain? We need a little bit more information. I, I, he, to, he, the act of toileting, he does. The hygienic portion of it, I'm not sure. Okay. Does uh, he have pain? Yes. Okay. Um, so, audience, non-operative treatment for this gentleman. Okay. 
Operative. Okay. All right. So, you know, some of the best operations you do, you never do. Yeah, C kind of like your the guy who was fused that you did a reverse on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I love that one. So I did, a, I did a reverse. I think it's pretty good. Critical evaluation. It looks great. Your RSA angle is fantastic. Your inset is great. Your uh, you have nice uh, big sphere, nice and lateral. It's, it's uh, technically, uh, from a radiographic standpoint, it looks excellent. Around five days later, I <laughs> slipped out of bed. I just <laughs> slid out of bed. What do you mean? I just slid out of bed. Okay, what the heck? Oh my God. You, you completely anniverted your yeah, So now your glenosphere is, is facing the yeah. x-ray beam. So, so, so now, do you do anything or you just say, let's see if you can heal anniverted? Yeah. You would. Yep. Abduction okay. sling immobilized. For, for the sake of continuing to move, I said, yeah, at this point, less is more. If you, if you figured out how to slide out of bed and break this like this, that's pretty impressive. Okay. <laughs> Immediately regret this decision. Not done yet. Oh, I slipped again. Oh, God. You're kidding me, right? No, no, I did. Now he has a periprosthetic humeral fracture. Now he's got this. Oh. Stem loose, I assume. What was that? Stems, stems, stems loose. loose. Yeah, he's like, oh, this, yeah. he's literally like three weeks oh, out. Hard. He's three yeah. weeks out. I mean, it's, uh, you know. I was only asking, I wasn't sure how far out he was, so yeah. But, yeah. I'm sorry? Just curious how far out he was and the stem was loose. Basically. Yeah, he's, he's like three weeks out. Stems out. Three weeks out. He's in pain. He's in my office. <clears throat> I'm clenched inside, wondering why I ever did this. Yeah. Okay, so um, panel, next step, leave him alone. I, I don't think you can leave him alone at this point. I think with the glenoid, you can make the argument uh, to leave him alone. Now you've got a loose stem, uh, it's in varus, it's grossly unstable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Mike, what kind of options would you consider if you're going to operate? Are you going to operate on them? I mean, I'd probably give him your business card and put him on a train to Philly. Um, yeah, Jersey. Thanks. It's not that far. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, this is you have to be out of the global pier to see me. I, I mean, this is a tough one. This is one where, you know, I mean, you're really running out of options here, right? Because your reverse is, your glenoid's gone, your proximal humerus is gone, and, I mean, you know, you don't really want to leave the guy with, like, a shoulder girdle stone, but I don't know if you could really leave that. Jack? Um, you, you do, I mean, you can reconstruct his proximal humerus. The issue is that his glenosphere is anterior. He's an unreliable patient. Yeah. So I think, you know. And he's somewhat of a functional quadruped in many ways. Right. Yeah, so I, I think in this circumstance, understanding the patient, you know, he's going to continue to slip because he's, he's no longer stable. His glenoid is no longer articulating with his, with his proximal humerus, and his proximal humerus and the stem are unstable. So I think in this person, going back, taking everything out, you know, maybe fixing this proximal humerus and putting a spacer in, allowing some glenoid bone to heal, taking this glenosphere out, and then leaving him immobilized until he heals, uh, and then maybe leaving the spacer in forever is something that I would consider versus a, a hemi, uh, and leaving him until he heals, and because you can't fuse him, uh, and you don't want to do a revision reversal on someone like mm -hmm. this guy. So I think for, for this person, it's taking everything out, putting a hemi in or a spacer, uh, always have to rule out infection in someone like this person and fixing yep. the proximal humerus with suture uh, and or some other type of limited f internal fixation. So I, I went, <coughs> I went Vosbickian on this. Okay. How many people remember George Bush being president in this room? A pretty young crowd here. <laughs> All right. Um, so I, I, I opted for resection. Yeah, I, mean, I think resection is a, is, a, is, a, is a great idea. The issue is that, you know, just getting this bone together. Make, make sure you didn't have endothelial infection like you mentioned. Yep. And you can see just everything's just a... So did you, did you suture his bone together? Or did you throw an anchor in his glenoid and just, you know, try to keep yoke no. it to kind of keep it together? Flip his pec over no. and try to keep him... I didn't do Al-Hassan uh, taco, no. Okay. So you can see... You just get this screwed in, it just comes right out the whole thing, stems out, That's your everything came out. Humeral extraction ever. Yeah. 
So this is what he has. I mean, the bone's kind of there. I, I don't know what Glennon's going to do. The irony of this now is he, he, I have six-month follow-up on him, and he's asking me to operate on his right side. And I'm like, there's no chance I'll touch you ever again. He's actually reasonably comfortable and happy with his left side as far as his pain goes. All right, keep moving. Case four. Ooh, elbow, okay. Um, oh. Elbow pain, distal humerus fracture 2008, numerous operations. Let me just tell you my bias on the elbow when you start treating it with like massive reconstruction and or arthroplasty. After two operations, the third one has about an 85% chance of failure and it just increases from there. So that's just been my, so 18 prior left elbow operations. Now, oh. I, didn't, I, didn't know that I, I didn't know that algorithm until, this was quite a few years ago, until I went through this, this with experience with this, late, with this, with this gentleman. So, so um, underwent revision by one of my partners, but then he moved out of the area and she thought I was nice enough to take care of her. And I was like, oh, but he's really good. Um, so painful range of motion, neurovascularly intact. This is what you have. So this is a sequela of trauma. Unfortunately, it's, it's a sequela that we sometimes see. And, you know, the, uh, I can tell you the plate that's there, those uh, circlash cables, I only know this after being in her elbow, are in, embedded in the bone. So uh, getting, that, uh, getting all that stuff out of there is uh, quite challenging if you decide to do that. Okay. Mike, mm -hmm. what do you think? What do you think first thing I'd worry about is, is, this thing, is this thing infected? Did the infection work up? Unfortunately, everything came back negative. So she's still, she's still persistent. She wants surgery. She wants, he, wants, he wants surgery. He wants surgery. He wants surgery. It's, um, you know, yeah, like. And, you know, I think if you're, if you're looking at this person, and I did a case not too dissimilar from this not that long ago, I think at some point you, you kind of have to resign yourself that whatever you do is number 19 has to be the end of it. And, and you know, it's got to be something more definitive. So, you know, one thing you got to worry about is that soft tissue has been stripped and beaten 18 times. So her ability to heal something is not going to be exactly ideal. And I think that at this point, anything that's motion sparing is, is gone. I think those options are, are, you know, out of it for her or him. So I think, you know, the reality of it is, I think you're going to have to shorten it and, and fuse it, probably. I don't think there's anything motion sparing you can do that's not going to end up as a disaster. Okay, fusion. Um, who, who would operate on this lady uh, in the audience? Operation? Okay. Uh, Joe, what's the, again, there's been 18 surgery, what's the issue at this time? Is just the humeral components loose or pain? Or what's, I mean, what's it's clearly issue? continuing to balloon out, loosen. It's painful. She can't use it. Um, she just, she's. And does she have motion? At, um, she has passive motion, but her active motion is not there good. There are multiple issues. And, and you can triceps. feel things. Yeah, she's like, got triceps. And rotational stable, like so so you, can feel it, you can feel it kind of flipping around in there. Is there, is there, is there. No, it's just been a gradual process. Yeah, secondary to the, you know, moment arms. Have you tried arms. casting her or bracing her? I have not. It's a good, good technique if you have somebody who you may want to consider like, nothing on or fusion at some So point. are you, okay, so you're in the camp of long-term bracing or uh, she, fusion? The problem, she's 55. She's got triceps insufficiency. Yeah. She has 18 surgeries. She now has a humeral component which is rotated, is out the bone. Her soft tissue envelope is poor. Uh, her bony envelope is terrible also. So in order for you to, to obtain a fusion would be extremely difficult. Uh, a tumor prosthesis would also be extremely heroic, which I know you're probably thinking about in this circumstance. Uh, allograft reconstruction of the, of the, of the ulna, uh, long stem humerus, you know, her, her, her bone and her soft tissue are all deficient here. So. Uh, Allograph reconstruction of the ulna, just because of that little proximal bone loss, or well, she's she's got no she's got no triceps. Right, no, she doesn't. I think if you're going to do something, you, you know, you may want to cons. I mean, these are all options. Allograph yeah. reconstruction of the of the ulna with a with a long stem ulna, or maintain the ulna, uh, distal humeral uh, tumor prosthesis. 
you know, do you do you stage this? Do you is she going to need a fly? I mean, these are all, these are all. Yeah, I mean, some of my worst complications have been uh, elbow, multiply operated on elbow with their soft tissue envelope necrosing and requiring flap and so on and so forth. So I think for her, but to fuse her, do you need a fibula? Yeah, you know, I mean, a, so a that's free fibula because I can tell you terrible. that bone, having been in there, is pretty avascular. Yeah, it's, it's like it's dead. dead bone. It's dead. You can see her humerus is. It's just moved and it's it's just dead. Yeah, I mean, yep. so the, to be the, the hand weenie guy, but you know, to the free fib is not a bad idea if you get in there and that bone is just toast, right? And one of the nice things, and the one we did not long ago, my fellow and I were talking about this, is that the advantage of the elbow fusion is that if you are triceps and biceps deficient, it doesn't matter because you're mm -hmm. no longer articulating the yeah. elbow, so that the condition of your biceps and triceps are no longer an issue, but and the, you can but shorten. The, but the bone's the issue. But the, the bone problem is, issue, can right? you get it to heal? And the advantage of a free fib, if you're worried about that, is that you can take a skin paddle with the free fibula. It's not a gigantic skin paddle, but it might be enough to get you there so that you can close it without tension, and then you're not having whatever your internal cast, aka plate, is pressing against the skin. Okay, so I'm not gonna belabor this too much more here. Uh, Pre-op workup, we did this, additional imaging, I did that. Bone scan, CT, pre-op infectious workup. Um, Does she have a functioning hand? Yes, fully functional. Even though she's had 18 surgeries? Fully functional. Ulnar nerve is Nothing is out. Wow. She can feel two-point discrimination perfectly. Wow. No carpal tunnel. Sorry, Mike. Trigger finger? <laughs> no, she doesn't even trigger. So, <clears throat> um, oh. so I did a um, tumor prosthesis. Um, I use neuromonitoring pretty liberally, you especially well, in, in complex, um, you know, isolated ulnar nerve, uh, did a, uh, you know, pretty, pretty long operation as far as operative time. This is what reconstructed. This is the uh, uh, SRS uh, modular. Cut out all the bad bone. I, I, I could. I there. Was, you couldn't work with it. It was just terrible. Yeah. Did you vac her? No. Okay. No. She's she's ironically never had uh, wound healing problems, and her, her wound closed. So, I'll give you follow up on her. She's now has a resection arthroplasty, and she's living with it, and she has a functional brace that she wears, because this ultimately also loosened. Again, not infectious. It just, yeah. it could never, her protoplasm. You know, yeah, could never get her sick. So we could keep moving. All right, <clears throat> case six. Oh, this is, uh, okay, 67-year-old female. I, 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 I took some liberal uh, history here just to add. History of uh, elbow problems. You're not wrong. <laughs> Auto-fused elbow of unknown origin. <laughs> also schizophrenic with Parkinson's. Oh, good, good. Thanks for well, setting her up. <laughs> fell and sustained a fracture around her autofused elbow. So she had an autofused elbow. Now she fell and had a fracture around that elbow. So pretty interesting, right? Okay. Asif. Mm. Mm. Mm, delish. Yeah. So, so, so prior to this fracture, no motion. And it's no open. Problem. It's open. For yeah. three weeks. It's open. For, a couple for three weeks. Yeah, I forgot that open, part. Sorry. Open for three weeks this for real? Is, this is yeah, yeah, yeah. For three weeks. Huge. She was using it to just kind of crutch around with it. Got it. Well, I mean, listen, at the end of the day. I think the auto fusion of the elbow makes it easier for you. Yeah, irrespective of the fact that it's fused, at this point, you're dealing with a supracondylar, essentially, a fracture of the, of the distal humerus. It's, it's open. So the one thing that's good is you're not really worried about elbow motion necessarily because that's irrelevant at this point. So you can just manage the fracture. If it's truly been open for that long, I wouldn't proceed with primary internal fixation. So you're going to go in there, you're going to debride. Uh, maybe do multiple debridements um, yeah. to make sure that you've got a uh, good bone, healthy, um, mi uh, mitigate any risk of infection, perhaps follow lab markers just to be sure, and then you'll go in for internal fixation. In terms of internal fixation, uh, you know, we can talk about all sorts of different plating strategies, orthogonal, parallel, et cetera, but she doesn't have a normal distal humerus, so um, you can still apply those principles, but you can also make the argument that she's out of fuse, so you can do almost like a bridge plate type of fixation and use a long... Big, uh, DCP. big posterior. Yeah, like the like the small most small practices have like a 12 hole DCP in the system. You can order a special order of 14, 16, 18 long DCPs, bend that to 90 degrees, and even compression plate that, fix it to the ulna, compression plate it to the to the humerus. But I think I would wait to fight another day and just make sure I'm, I've debrided that adequately and um, and wash it and make sure it's clean prior to proceeding with internal Okay. Fixation. So anyone disagree in the audience?
Okay, great. I see Leslie, my friend's here. Leslie, what would you do? She's like, I didn't hear the history. What the hell are you asking me for? <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, perfect. She didn't even hear the history. She nailed it. All right, so there you go. These are uh, Armenian beads. Yeah. They look like little eyes. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> so, Monty. so then, Monty in the so then, and, and you whacked out her. Dick. So, so then, so take us through your thought process, Mike, after this. So you know, the big thing with her was that had been out for three weeks. So the end of the bone was, I mean, it basically looked like it was bobby charred, but it was just dirt and contamination from you know the environment in which she lives. Um, so basically, you know, early goal was to just get back to, to living bone and get beads in there. Took her back multiple times, changed the bead pouch out a few times until tissue started to look better, CRP was coming down, and, you know, kind of get the infection under control because, again, something like this, you want to be one and done. You don't want to have to go back into this elbow, you know, 20 times. Okay. So did she like this? Was she going to live with it? No, I mean, the problem also is that with her condition, she also is a bit of a functional quadruped, so she kind of needs that arm to get around and because her, I mean, her level of independence without this arm is even worse than it is now. Okay, uh, audience, who would do a, a nail? We, we already had one vote for a nail. Nail, you got to raise your hand. You said nail, come on. Well, no, he, your, your colleague there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's done the nail already. Uh, ORIF. Staged RIF, raise your hands. Okay, um, total elbow, distal humeral re replacement with total elbow. Uh, leave her alone. I, I would make sure she's not happy. happy with her. Okay, 85% with with uh, of you did not vote. So, like, what does that mean? Don't like, you it. are going to be a provider, I assume. So what are you going to do, just stare at them in the office? Doc, what would you do if it was your elbow? So raise your hand again. Nail. RIF. Oh, now, now all of a sudden everyone's arms aren't tired. Okay, great. It's called po audience participation, guys. You get in what you put out in here, right? So, all right. So how come you didn't do a t total elbow? I'm just asking. I'm serious. It's a legitimate uh, that, question. That's what you would do, Joe. Yeah, I mean... It's a higher RVU. She's motion. I she mean, hasn't I mean, had motion for it, a long time. I can help you. Yeah, I mean, if she was functioning well with this elbow fusion, presumably well for <clears> that long, if God knows when it's been on a fuse still, I kind of wanted to keep that and not take that down because she can function with her elbow at that degree of motion. The other thing is total elbows now, I mean, it, at this point, I kind of only do it on, like, the tiny little rheumatoid lady that's not on 50,000 yeah. yards, and they love you, and nobody else does. So I, I've narrowed my indications a lot of total elbow over the years. Okay, so he did his counseling. Arthrodesis. Well, she's already arthrodesed. So, mm -hmm. so basically, you, you extended your fixation yep. to maintain. Now, did you augment this with anything? I dumped a ton of bone. I mean, like, scrape everything, dump a ton of bone. Because the last what thing kind I of bone graft did you use? So for her? Putty, uh, BMAC, infuse. I used this. I mean, I, I have no complex, but no I, used, work special. I, I packed a bunch of Vivigen in there as well. Okay. And I have no complex with that. But it's just did you use like an articulating tensioner to come? She looks thin. Out. Any skin problems so, with closing this? So luckily, because she's got kind of this floppy, kind of very redundant floppy skin, so presumably she was much larger at some point. Luckily, with shortening her, there was enough skin there that I could actually get it closed primarily. Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like Jack's neck tissue. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so just kind of advanced the tissue a little bit, and it, it came together nicely. Put a vac on her for a week. Okay. Good. Very good. Interesting case. We got through. We're going to get through seven. Yeah, we got uh, six more minutes. We so have six and a half minutes. I'm timing here. That's why I brought you. Eighty-two year old. You need to sit. <clears throat> what? You need to sit. Is your defibrillator? No, no, no I'm, I'm not a hand surgeon. If I was a hand surgeon, I'd be on a stool right now with my loops on trying to see these but, slides. But you, but, but, but you haven't been shot a couple times this morning yet by your defibrillator? 18-year-old <laughs> female. She was in the UK, endorses shoulder pain, pre-diabetic, independent. Okay? Hit by a biker, bicycle. Comes from the UK, 
These are her x-rays. <coughs> Asif. Proximal humerus fracture, I'm trying to characterize it a little bit. More than that. Are we dislocated as well? It looks like the glenoid the and the glenoid is reduced. Yeah, has rotated out. Any more imaging? Any CT by chance? Like yes, yes, I'll, I'll give you that. I, I just want to uh, have everyone weigh in. Uh, Vazbikian, anything? I'd get a CT to figure out what's going on before. No, 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 on these x-rays, buddy, on these x-rays. Way, way, to, way, to, way to leverage. What do you think about these x-rays? Is she pre-morbidly, pre um, pre-injury, arthritic, non-arthritic? She's arthritic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, Jack. Yes. What else do you think? What else am I thinking? Well, not, not thinking, no, just about these x-rays. What you're thinking I'm scared of, but actually I just want you to talk about these x-rays. <laughs> uh, glenoid fracture I'm worried about, but she actually looks relatively well-located and well-maintained. and she's where, where do you see the glenoid fracture? Uh, if you look antero and fairly just beneath yeah, the coracoid, it looks, it looks abnormal. It's kind of hard to see. On the <clears throat> film to your left, which appears to be maybe a, gra a grassy view, maybe I can't tell. Maloney's line looks like it's intact, but... On the right, you do see some, maybe some abnormality with, with the antero and fear of glenoid. Like South Carolina there. Right. So. Okay. Both the, is, both does, the is everyone, does everyone see that? I don't, I don't know if I have a pointer here. Yeah, here it is. You see this? Mm hmm Scatula. Yeah. And you see this? You see it right there. Yep. Right there. Yeah, that's that's what I'm right? Glen yep. Glenoids so that's, that, if you had these two x-rays, truth be told, I'm in clinic, I'm in a rush, and I'm kind of like, th these were like not the ones we uploaded, and I was like, I don't know, something is weird about this, um, beyond just the tuberosities being all over the place. So we get a CT scan. And they're not that bad, the tuberosities in this patient, I would do nothing. I'd let her heal. So, so if she was a proximal humerus without a glenoid, you would let her heal? At 82 years it's of age. very functional, it's a dominant arm. Uh, that, I mean, that proximal humerus, I've had patients, I, I tell people a lot, you know, horrible extras <clears throat> not mean bad function. So in this, in this patient population with underlying uh, degenerative joint disease, I have no issues with treating her conservatively. So <clears throat> I've actually become much more conservative. So real world, um, who in the audience um, is, is doing nothing? R raise your hand. Okay. That's about 32% of you. For this uh, injury, The rest of you are doing what? Scapula fracture. RIF? Face with a coracoid injury. No, I'm not touching that. No, no. You're okay. just asking for trouble. Listening to me. So, so, okay, always be honest. So, I didn't have the CT scan. Mm -hmm. and, and we didn't appreciate the x-rays as well as we should have. She's in the holding area. I look at the CT scan. And I go, hey, uh, you excuse me, we're going to have to cancel you. Good. You're not an operative candidate. That's, that's great. <clears throat> so... You know, this stuff happens. I mean, you just have to own that you make mistakes and you miss stuff. See, you see that? It's a huge, it's a huge glenoid fracture. But even in, even mm -hmm. in a relatively functional 82-year-old without the scapula fracture, the <clears throat> glenoid scapula fracture, I would still treat this patient conservatively. I just worry about that tuberosity piece because if, 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 you, if she can't get her arm she, overhead. She's and already arthritic. I got a ton of patients that have poor x-rays that do well. Yeah. Well, she's definitely getting non opportunity And I'm not, I'm not following the Profer trial whatsoever. I'm just saying yeah. from my experience. She's getting non operative treatment now, so that's what she's going to get, and she'll, she'll hopefully be as happy as a clam. Any comments from the audience? Okay. Um, we've done seven cases. Okay. Let's see what this one is. Uh, We'll do elbow later. Okay. Uh, I think I'm going to end now because we have about a minute, which I don't think we can go through this in a minute, unless you want me to. No. Okay. Comments. Questions from the audience? <laughs> All right. There's... I have one question. Yes. Are you doing less total elbows for fractures now than you were 10 years ago, or are you doing more? Uh, personally, I'm doing less. Less. I do none. Very rare. <clears throat> my age limit has gone up 
in the sense that um, you know, if you look at the data on total elbows, most of it's like 65 is considered elderly, and that's the age group that they use for a total elbow. I think it's way too young for a total elbow. The longevity of the total elbow is not that great. So you've got to be like late 70s, 80s for me to start to consider it because that longevity is just not there. Um, and the demands that the younger folks are putting, and young means in their 60s and early 70s are putting on the elbow, they just don't last. So my threshold to do to elbows, elbow is you've got to be j truly elderly to justify it. Yeah, I, I agree 100%. Bag right. of bones is actually not that I was going to say, exactly. 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 If you're in the bag. total elbow algorithm in my mind, you're already in the bag of bones yeah, bag algorithm. Bag of bones is actually not that So bad. you're probably getting a bag of bones or something fixed. How many in the audience have done more than five total elbows in the last two years? Yeah, that's a problem too because, you know, <clears throat> if you're doing something that infrequently, you're not very good at it at all. And that, that plays to the fact that not only are the implants not that great, the, the surgical ex, uh, expertise is not as great in, in, in general out there. I mean, if you look at, this, at the, <clears throat> the uh, landmark articles from Mayo in regards to total elbow uh, for fracture, uh, even at Mayo, their, their, their landmark article is basically 21 patients. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Joe, Hope you learned something. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you.